Okay, so welcome back. Uh, so we are in the last uh, module, the last video for the week four, where in week four we have been discussing on plastic ban, uh, especially uh, we had uh, discussed about the Indian scenario and some uh, global scenario and then we, our focus was more on China plastic ban and its impact on global plastic waste management. So we'll continue that discussion uh, and we'll start from exactly where we left in the previous video. We were, if you remember, we were looking at this particular uh, uh, table as well as this discussion on uh, in terms of the US scrap export to China, uh, where it, uh, that what is the impact of the ban. So the plastic ban came somewhere in the middle over here. And uh, so this is uh, kind of, this is pr prior to ban so my prior to ban and then then we have this is a post ban and as you can see these numbers kind of speaks for themselves if you kind of uh, look at carefully there is a drop of nearly 37.48 percent for paper uh, 92 percent for plastic so after this china ban there has been drop of uh, 92 percent of plastic waste is not going to uh, earlier what was going to ch China for the same period in 2017 if you compare that with same period 2018 there was a drop of 92 percent of the plastic waste going to China and that's not only plastic there are other waste components as well since the ban is not only on plastic it's on other waste but in our uh, since this course is focused on plastic we are talking about that and um, and th there is of course a lot of uh, anxiety in, in, the, in, in the US market, similar anxiety is there in Australia, uh, all those developing countries which were relying a lot on China's uh, in terms of managing their waste and with this China short ban that has become a problem. So what we'll do is we'll uh, have a uh, quick look at a video which was done by CNBC on in terms of uh, the impact of this China ban which explains it very clearly in for the US market but the similar uh, similar things are there for Australia and other countries as I said earlier and you can find several videos on YouTube discussing that these days because this is a very very hot topic in terms of how to manage the garbage now since uh, uh, the, the Chinese will not take it and uh, so let's uh, look at that video then we'll discuss that and uh, then we'll try to conclude this particular uh, uh, lecture on uh, uh, bans and uh, impact on global plastic waste management. So we'll get started uh, and uh, I'll let you uh, watch this video first and then we'll have some discussion on it. Into the market. So now that China isn't taking those recycled bales, buyers have fewer options on where they can even send these materials. That just means that buyers are being more selective on what they buy and recycling centers are left with stockpiled bales of recyclables. Well, for recyclers, it's it's been kind of a horror story actually because um, you know, we have limited budgets and limited labor to put at these sorting programs. So because brokers and buyers of scrap materials are not buying these things, if we don't meet standards, we've been looking for alternative markets where they will accept the purity that we can, we can financially create. We used to send to China, now we go to Indonesia, Vietnam, Korea, uh, but those uh, smaller countries with smaller markets are filling up. Since National Sword, uh, the Burbank Recycle Center has had some real problems um, with materials accumulating and with the, with the price that we can actually get for materials. So in, in January, we got rid of uh, 500 tons of paper that we got absolutely no payment for. We can't get rid of plastic clamshells, the kinds of things that might be around produce, salads, berries. We can't get rid of those. We have no market for those. We used to generate about $50,000 a month on, on scrap materials. And now it's almost in the opposite direction where we're paying about 40, you know, between 40 and $50,000 a month um, in processing fees that aren't made up for 
by scrap commodity sales. In the entire U.S., recycled plastic scrap exports to China have dropped 92% over the first five months of 2018. Well, if China doesn't take this material, um, we don't have any choice. Either we give it away to someone that has space to, say, warehouse it until markets change or until they find a market to sell it into, or we just have to bury it. And, you know, I hope not, but there may come a day when we have to burn this stuff. I, I don't know. It's, this is a big problem. The way that this could play out for consumers is, uh, and it's already happening, some cities are reducing the list of materials accepted in the recycling carts and in the programs. Um, I think we're going to see higher, uh, potentially higher prices in what it costs to process waste and to, you know, create recycling programs that work. And it's, you know, we focus on China and the change of policies, but quite honestly, what has happened is the United States has lost control of consumption. We're, we are in some trouble because we've become so accustomed to so many products and packagings that are short-lived. So we're going to have to, as, as U.S. citizens, we're going to have to be um, very cognizant of who we are as consumers and what the effect of that is going to be. To help the situation, Hampel thinks change needs to be made in manufacturing, but there are some things that everyone can do to help. Buy bulk. Buy the biggest container that you can. Don't buy the single serve, uh, you know, multiple, multiply wrapped products that, you know, everything has another piece of plastic around it. Secondly, uh, use all the reusables that you can. Um, if you if you're a frequent drinker of beverages, bring your own container and refill it. You know, that bottled water is, is a real problem with its packaging. The other things you can do is, you know, bring your own bags. Shop locally at the farmer's market where you're getting fresh produce and food. Looking forward, I, um, it's very unstable. It, we just don't know how this is going to play out. It's a, it's a big ask to change things very quickly in the United States about our consumption habits. It's a big ask to find other countries and other mills and processors to take the amount of waste that we generate in the U.S. every year and try to get it into reuse programs or recycling programs. So it's, um, I wish I had a crystal ball to predict the future and I just don't. So as you saw in this particular video, what, what was uh, uh, presented to you was a mixed a stream recycling. It was a mixed stream recycling. Where, what does a mixed stream mean? That you take all the recyclables and put it together in one container. And that one container gets loaded into the recyclable truck, uh, the recycling truck. And then the recycling truck brings it to the uh, material recycling facility. So since it's single stream recycling, where all the different uh, waste recyclables are mixed together, the chances of contamination is much higher. And since the chances of contamination is much higher, it is not meeting the standard prescribed by the China ban now, which uh, if you remember, which we discussed earlier was 0.5%. So if we go for multi stream recycling, I, it may we will probably do better. But the thing is that if you go for multi, more and more multi-stream recycling, that means more and more trucks are required, you, the infrastructure gets complex, and that requires a lot of money to be invested, a lot of manpower to be invested there. So there has to be an economic, techno-economic feasibility analysis of whether we should go for multi-stream or a single stream. Earlier, many, many municipalities in North America or other places in the world were going for multi-stream recycling. And then they actually moved back to single stream recycling because that was easier to do it. And the China was ready to take those dirty uh, uh, recyclables. Now, since China doesn't want those dirty recyclables, when I say China, I'm also talking about other countries which imports garbage from overseas. Other countries will follow suit too. Other countries will also start putting those similar standard as China has done, having less and less contamination, pretty much having a clean recyclables. So what does that mean in terms of the waste management from a uh, plastic waste management, say from an Indian point of view, we will start seeing a lot of these uh, plastic 
dirty plastic recyclables trying to come to India because since uh, the, the market is China is not uh, there anymore. So they will try to send it to a country like India and which uh, is already happening. So of course that will become a problem uh, that is a challenge as well as an opportunity challenge if it goes into the informal recyclers where it is not managed properly it becomes a challenge and with the level of contamination coming in opportunity if we can take this opportunity and develop our old recycling industry what china did is they imported all these dirty recyclables from overseas for almost uh, two decade and they developed their own recycling industry now they are and uh, they also started uh, recycling within their own country so there are a lot of uh, recycling programs in place in many cities in china now so they are they are they have a good recyclable material coming from within the country so they don't have to rely on the recyclables coming from overseas see they were not doing it for charity it is for uh, because they wanted those recyclables uh, they wanted those material so that it can go to their factories for manufacturing similarly in the in the contest in indian contest if you think about if we have to when we set up a lot of factories in India with Make in India and all those things that is we, we need to do, uh, if, you, if you really build things in India, we need material. And uh, recyclable uh, is a good source of material, secondary material source. And so we do, rather than relying on the virgin material, we can use this recyclable material. And that's a, a good uh, uh, source of material, but at the same time, it has to be clean then only you can use it. If it's not clean, you cannot use it. So that's the reason why uh, it, it either has to be cleaned, uh, you accept the clean material as China is, is doing now, or you take the dirty material and clean it within your own country. And But of course, it will have the impact on environment, but uh, you can set systems in place uh, where you can do that. And at the same time, try to develop the recycling market within the country. So those are uh, the issues that uh, this particular video was uh, wrestling about and it talked about not only uh, plastic, it talked about the other waste stream as well, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which was going to China and now uh, the countries are struggling to what to do with that particular waste. Uh, so this is just an example video. You will find several videos like this on uh, YouTube and other sources uh, on um, looking at the impact on recyclable or impact on entire uh, waste recycling industry because of this uh, uh, China short policy or China ban uh, which we popularly known as. So that's uh, what uh, we wanted to kind of give you a, an idea. There are uh, as I said this is a very fluid situation in waste management sector right now. Things keep on changing. So again if you find something interesting stuff share it in the discussion board with your other friends and that's uh, will help us uh, to talk about uh, in terms of uh, uh, the waste uh, uh, in terms of the waste uh, uh, like a waste plastic waste management uh, stuff that is happening around the world so now to really make the ban work we need to talk about uh, since the whole uh, week we have been discussing on plastic ban we looked at the issues of uh, uh, plastic uh, uh, ban in uh, different countries uh, around the world. So if really to make this uh, ban work, there are laws, laws has, there are laws are being made, but the laws needs to be enforced. So laws are not enforced appropriately, then the, your compliance is reduced or eliminated. So in this particular uh, uh, pie chart, which you can see behind me or in, a, in the diagram, there are different aspects we are looking at. We are looking at the enforcement, we are looking at the collection and disposal, we are looking at loopholes, we are looking at black markets, and we are also looking at the alternatives. So for a really this plastic ban to work, uh, this the multi strategy has to be incorporated where we have to look at the enforcement where the laws are implemented first of all laws needs to be practical oriented too say if you start uh, banning too many stuff and without giving the alternatives to the market alternatives at the reasonable price not too costly uh, not too practically challenged like it has to be uh, similar material easier to use material and then the laws will be could potentially be enforced. So laws are not enforced appropriately, then compliance is reduced. And if the plastic bag uh, ban is there, but the waste disposal have to be, it has to collect those plastic bags because the plastic will be there in the waste stream. 
There will be loopholes. It is crucial to identify the loopholes and try to work on that. There is always be black market issues, uh, black market emerging in place where plastic has been banned. So if the plastic is banned, there will be black market selling those plastic. There will also be uh, uh, like people trying to make uh, money out of uh, those uh, black market uh, stuff. And then we have to provide sustainable alternative for a successful plastic ban. So this is uh, uh, as we, if you look at uh, this particular week's uh, content, uh, we started with talking about the ban. We have been working on ban in Indian contest in terms of mostly single use plastic, those uh, less than uh, 50 micron size uh, plastic uh, plastic bags, single use plastic bags, those black color plastic that you get for the grocery or chicken or fish uh, store, uh, the thin plastic, uh, the transparent thin plastic that you get for the vegetable market or even uh, when you go for some uh, small uh, snacks and other places like jalebi, samosas and all that, you get those plastic bags there. And those plastic bags were pretty convenient. Uh, you have, I have seen people even using it for, say, if you go for buying Italy and then chutney and the sambar and all that, they will put it on those plastic bags. It's putting anything hot on those plastic bags actually is not good for health, but it's still it's convenient. People used to do that. and. Uh, but we are banning all of those stuff, which is kind of a welcome move because those are the nuisance stuff uh, which creates a problem. The question is having a proper alternative in place which uh, people can use and, uh, and the alternative should be, since we see our lifestyle has become of a convenience lifestyle. So we started uh, rather than creating our own container uh, for taking all those uh, uh, like, uh, like sambar chutney and other stuff that we used to do as a kid. Now people take in those plastic pouches, which is uh, not at all good for health, but it's still we do it because we don't have to carry those material. You can do it along the way back from your office to the home. You pick those material and go home and eat. So those, those things will go away, but there has to be some alternatives in place uh, which uh, can, be, uh, can be used. And then all the, these things will actually go away. There will be, otherwise you will have, uh, it's still like, um, I see that in many many states where the plastic ban has been in place for the single use plastic, is still those plastic bags are being given to the consumer from like below the table or some or uh, in a in an illegal way, but it's, it's still happening because there is no proper alternative in place. And part of it is behavioral issue, part of it is also is a technical issue and practical issue too. It's not that uh, plastic has made our life so comfortable. Uh, to some uh, many extent uh, that it, it is it becomes kind of part of life from morning to evening we are using different plastic materials and when we are when we are telling somebody to stop using it all of a sudden without providing proper alternative it many times it does not really work so and then uh, we, we also looked at uh, some places where they have made it work by forcefully uh, putting some policies in place in Africa one country does it a wonderful job a lot of fine in place and that financial uh, uh, penalty is always uh, kind of works better than the other uh, source of uh, penalty. Uh, and then uh, we looked at uh, the overall uh, in terms of uh, having this ban effect, uh, especially uh, when uh, in terms of plastic waste management, uh, how could the China ban, we discussed that uh, in more and more detail and its impact on plastic waste coming from across the globe into China and its impact for possible aftermath of plastic going to other countries and also coming to India and its impact in India. So from an Indian perspective, plastic waste is a huge deal. Presently, we have around 10 to 12 percent of our municipal solid waste is plastic waste, which uh, uh, the reports are suggesting, including some of the field study done by our research lab as well. And uh, so that's a that's a substantial quantity of waste. So out of 100 kg of waste, 12 kg is plastic. So that's that's and if you think about the volume, it will be much much higher because plastic is a lighter material. So we have to deal with this uh, in an effective way. So from now, uh, we so far in this particular course, we talked about what is plastic. We even looked at what is the plastic. Uh, uh, we talked about the plastic waste management issues a little bit. We talked about the policies, uh, plastic waste management policy of India and some global policies. So a little bit of EPR concept, we discussed that. And then we talked about this big China ban issue. So this now we have finished 50% of the course. 
in the rest 50 percent our our focus will go more into looking at uh, what are the environmental and human health aspect if we don't manage this plastic waste properly what is uh, how how to manage this plastic waste what are the technologies out there how to deal with those uh, uh, what are how what are the pros and cons of different technologies and how to implement those different technologies and then uh, we also talk about the whole concept of resource recovery circular economy and all so hope you are enjoying this course so far and uh, we have uh, been uh, as i said in the very beginning of this course there is no textbook for this particular course so we have been trying to collate material from different sources and putting it together to have a interesting course at the same time course which can provide you some knowledge so that you can help the society in this particular aspect of plastic waste management uh, wherever in whatever way you can uh, but again any any material that you find that we we should have talked about in the class or any discussion that you think should have happened in the class but has not happened in this and on a particular topic put it on the discussion board we will be more than happy uh, that uh, to have a lively discussion over there so thank you and uh, continue uh, uh, congratulations for finishing 50% of the course so looking forward to have a similar uh, input from you and similar enthusiasm from you in the next 50% thanks